My name is Scratcher, aka Scratch Clout, and we're back. Another special episode. Basically, we've been doing this sample clout thing and getting producers to come on and talk about how they sample stuff and whatnot. Last week, I was like, there's no way I can come on here and be talking about samples. There's bigger things going on in the world, and I need to speak on it. I decided to group some people together and talk about racism within the music industry, which is a uh, which is a real thing. This week, I've decided to put together well, white people because last week it was black people. And Ian, this week it's white people. From the moment I could like realize that there was a situation between different colored people, I've been speaking about it from then. So that's a long time, over 30 years. You know what I'm saying? I spoke to friends about it. I spoke to white people about it. I spoke to black people about it. I spoke to my parents about it. I spoke to my family about it. I spoke to musicians about it. I don't know, maybe because I'm seeing it more or noticing stuff more as I'm getting older or I'm more integrated into the industry. I don't know. But what I haven't seen is white people talking to white people. And that's the reason why I wanted to put this together today. Also, I wanted to say this is not an interview. I'm not going to be interviewing anybody. I want to put everyone here to discuss because last week I had to do it and I didn't really want to but I felt like I needed to do you understand like I didn't really want to go on there like literally I was saying to uh, Tim five minutes before I went to go on and speak I was like you know I'm too drained I've been I've been on social media all day I really didn't want to but you know what camera action and I went in and we spoke for over two hours and it happened so what I didn't want to hear was I don't feel comfortable talking about it, which, to be fair, I heard a lot of this week. Putting this together wasn't easy. So I appreciate everyone who's agreed to come on today. We have Tom Lee from uh, Local Action Records. We have Lara Ricks Martin from Objects Limited. Also, we have Blaze Belleville from Boiler Room and Platform. So, yeah, can we swing, swing them in? There we go. I ain't got questions for you. You know what I mean? There might be some people in the chat who might have some questions for you, but I have no questions for you. I just want to put you here and let you guys discuss it out. I know I've been speaking to Tom, actually, uh, you know, on the phone. I know you have you have a lot to say, so maybe you could, uh, you know, run forward with some stuff, but I'm going to literally fade out. But thanks for joining. Thanks for coming. Yeah, sure. All, all three of us are running companies in music, you know, run by white people, um, you know, companies and labels of various sizes. So I guess the natural way to start would be what's our sort of short term, medium term and long term um, reactions to to the situation and, and how we adapt what we do and adapt how we work, um, mm. both in terms of, I think, diversity, but something that's definitely stuck out to me recently um, I'm guessing we've all donated. I think for the label side, we donated five to six hundred pounds over the weekend. But it shouldn't take, um, you know, it shouldn't take a, a globally publicised tragedy um, to force us to do this. So something I've been thinking about a lot, I guess. And you know, I think over ten years of running the label, I've sort of um, things like diversity and stuff we're very conscious of um, and, and have been for some time. But what it's really made me think about is the responsibility of, in my field, white-run labels to channel funds and finances back into, um, you know, back into causes that um, have, you know, of people that have sacrificed for the culture that we inhabit um, and how we can actually make it part of our sort of structure as a label, whether that's um, in our deals or how we do royalties or whatever, to make sure as a label we're constantly funneling money back into the right channels and the right causes, I guess. So I know that we've been having behind the scenes a week. I've been talking to um, a lot of the artists on the label, primarily black and LB LGBTQ plus artists, but also friends, including Scratcher, um, about the best way to do this. Um, so I'm just curious as to what sort of conversations you're both having internally about the same thing. Some think that when I started Objects Limited, it was kind of in the forefront of my mind anyway. I mean, I know, so yeah. um, for those who don't know, Objects Limited only puts out um, artists that are 
women, non-binary, gender, um, different. Because of that, it was always like, well, what else can I do as well? Also focus on black women um, who are severely underappreciated um, in terms of how they're being released and lineups, all the rest of it. So um, for me, it was kind of something from the off. Um, but, you know, there's always still more to do. I, I find personally that I found it harder to reach out to British black women. I found it a lot easier to get like artists that are black in America, but to get British black voices, you have to really um, look around, um, which, which that you know, they're there. It's just that for whatever reason, well, structural reasons, it's, um, you know, harder to get to those voices and to get them on the label, get them out there. It's difficult because, you you know, the, the, I think for the last, we've been running, volumes been running for 10 years and um, I think what this, what the last couple of weeks has done is kind of radically shift my understanding of the problem up. I think it's, it's difficult to describe beyond, I think we have always felt like we're, uh, I guess, I guess to, to, to kind of make it like, to, to give us a short description, we've always felt to some extent that we're an ally and um, and have have been have, have sort of done things that I think prior to the last couple of weeks we'd felt were kind of us trying to challenge things and and do right um, you know like the stuff that most people would do in, in trying to make sure when you're hiring your workforce to diverse uh, trying to make sure um, you know what you represent culturally is a broad church and the big thing for me in the last couple of weeks has just been realizing that we've completely overlooked mm. the sort of microaggressions and, and constant uh the way that racism invades a black person or person of color's life uh on a kind of daily level and even in the most micro ways that are often the stories that don't get told and how you should never look at kind of far away news stories in america and and feel that that's not actually happening right here at home and so i guess I found myself a week later realizing that we'd done exactly that at Boiler Room. I think with hindsight, we've not recognized the almost kind of default disadvantage that a person of color might come into, even from the moment of applying to a job at Boiler Room through to uh, the interview, through to your first day and, and, your, and then your work and your kind of chances of success. I think that I, basically for me, the recognition is that it's not a level playing field and that in order for things to become more level um, across the entire company. And I say, I say this kind of talking, I think actually probably for a lot of music companies out there, um, but across the whole company, top to bottom, and especially at the top, we need to uh, recognize this and create policy and actually understand how to empower and have the right tools um, in place so that every person's got as good a chance as the other the next person i guess for me uh the things that are the kind of most immediate things we're doing are you know the sort of first wave of response was let's switch to away from global food banking network and towards uh raising money for uh, various bailout funds um and let's start to educate our own our audience let's start to have conversations internally and we made a donation straight away and all of that kind of thing. But I guess in, in the almost that like second stage, literally from today and next week, um, we're going to go through a kind of a real overhaul of how we run and kind of onboard and train people and, and build confidence with people and make sure that um, a person of colour can come into Boiler Room and have as good a chance as any. And you know, that we're of course going to continue to do kind of initiatives far beyond that. But I guess I made a commitment today on my Instagram and, and the sort of first two things we're going to do is make sure that, you know, the top of the company's never had uh, equal representation. There's never been a black person at the top of the company. There's never been uh, a person of color there consistently. It's been 
predominantly white since the very beginning. And I think that's a real issue. I think this kind of realization I've had in the last couple of weeks, I probably would have had five years ago. My focus is to change the environment within the company from the top to the bottom, even including moving myself to a kind of sideways to a position to make space for someone to come into the company, putting a new person to our board of directors, and then actually literally agreeing like hard, po I kind of want everyone at the company to follow the same thinking of what my mental journey's been the last couple of weeks, if not add to that. And, and to sort of almost set that in policy and anyone at the company needs to be on this reading on the same page. But yeah, I think creating a work environment where um, black people have the same uh, opportunity as everyone else. Um, and that will end up reflecting in everything we do in, you know, how we build our business commercially, uh, how, how we program the initiatives we come up with, the ideas we do. I, I think that the big thing that's changed for me is I've always looked at the things we've done, uh, be it kind of bringing certain people in and hiring and, uh, you know, if you sign a show like Gasworks, whatever it might be, and felt like we're really, uh, we'd kind of got our head screwed on right and we were doing all the right things. And just this last week has been a real uh, wake up that, uh, everything we're doing whilst it contributes if you don't look at the whole picture it's kind of paper thin and basically the status quo of embedded racism carries on so I guess our thing mm -hmm. is like trying to get at it right at the core because if we get that right it will reflect um, in everything we do okay I just want to kind of jump in because of what you're saying about hiring more black people um, in certain areas and all those sorts of things. But I think what's really a key point, especially with people like Boiler Room or radio stations, stuff like that, when they do anything with community, is it getting to those people? Or is it just a promotional tool that you're using to be like, look, we're doing it for, you know, black people, but actually, you're getting in DJs who are white, not even working class or whatever, to do those performances in those areas. So that's that's the issues that I have. I was working with some art centres to try and see if I could get um, some gigs in some areas, but try and get some local talent that was also someone who was um, a person of colour, preferably like a black person who was in these areas to try and promote them. Um, and, and I think that's more what we need to do, like engage at a local level with people and help the community, not just to have it like, oh, I'm a label and I'm coming in here, but push them forward. I try and think about me as a label. It's about what I can do and put back into the community. You know, it's, it's very embedded in what we do. We, we tell stories from the inside. We, uh, I think the kind of programming is already very diverse. I think all of our shows and initiatives are driven by finding a kind of really interesting, important community and letting them platform we facilitate. I think, I think the issue for us is much more about, like all of those things are almost like quite in check. I think it's the stuff that sits below that that's really systemic that, you know, for, uh, we're highlighted well where, for example, if we do a show, Cape Town and sends an all white crew, I think things like that, you know, what, what the kind of, what we focus on culturally and musically and the people we champion, that not being reflected behind the scenes. Is that something you've done? Is, have you put on, um, a show in Cape Town and only had an all white crew. Is that something that you've done? Or is that because it's I think it's important. Know, I... Oh, okay. Because I think it is important going forward. Like, it's okay saying you want to change now, but it's good to look back and be like, you know what, I did that wrong. I think I should kind of uh, like be open about your past about what you have done wrong or right. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, I would say on that note, Kind of tying into what Blaze said about hires and stuff. I mean, local action, our, our artist roster is quite diverse. And actually, traditionally, our biggest artists have always been people of color, um, all women and non-binary artists from 10 years ago till now, actually. But this is sort of, you know, it's not something we pat ourselves on the back about, but it's just, it, we do have quite a diverse roster. But um, 
something that's really made me think about this week is like, you know, who are we using to engineer records? Who are we using to master records? Who are we using for video directors, PRs? And, you know, there's, there's an element of diversity there. It's not all straight white men by any degree, but it could be better. And that's something rather than necessarily the roster on the label, this has really made me look at who we're hiring behind the scenes on projects and who we're outsourcing to as well. Um, and to try and something I'm looking into this, you know, or have been looking to this week as well is like internal diversity quotas um, when it comes to that. You can hear me, yeah? Because I'm going to yeah, say yeah. something. Yeah, yeah. Okay, Camilla Rose says, we need to see changes in public, be transparent with pay, Let's put black people in the urban, ensuring that everyone is truly represented both sides of the scene and of the scene too. Um, question for Blaze. Why did it take George Floyd's death to finally question the way Boiler Room operates? And I was actually thinking that, and not just Boiler Room, but, um, you know, local action, objects, hyperdub, everything, you know, ev everything and everyone and every part of this industry. Um, I know, like, we can say, oh, the straw that broke the camel's back or whatever, but it's kind of weird for me to sit here to, to hear you say this when, like, you know, I, I I know that it should have been done ages ago. You know what I mean? But I, I don't know. How do you feel about no, I know that? Because I, I feel a certain way yeah, about we, that. Yeah, I mean, we spoke about this on the phone this week, Scratcher. And I guess I think what the point Camilla makes about transparency is also a really, really valid one. Because I think, and I'm, I, knew, I think we've seen it with a lot of like big brands this week. It's all very well saying something. But I think transparent fin financial action needs to happen. I mean, from our side and, you know, we're a much smaller um, entity than Boiler Room, let alone whatever, TikTok. But, you know, going on, going forward, we're actually going to have it written into our release contracts that um, we give 10% of our label share per release um, to a charitable cause chosen in collaboration with the artist, but also, I guess, kind of in respect to the um, minority groups that kind of make up the sphere that we, we operate in and that we, we wouldn't exist without. Um, and we're also going to be going back through our back catalogue and account, uh, also donating 10% um, of all our back catalogue earnings um, going forward as well. So it's not just something that's tied into new releases. And like I say, you know, we're, we're a small entity compared to a lot of stuff. And I'm actually quite, you know, again, we talked about this on the phone, but like I almost feel ashamed that it's taken something like this to make me realise that being a white male run label that, you know, primarily releases black music, um, or you know exclusively releases black music there's not really any music that isn't black music in terms of origin or people of color um you know it's actually irresponsible to do that um and although obviously we pay our artists and we we account regularly to our artists it's actually irresponsible to not be looking at other ways we can um channel our money um into the right mm. causes so yeah it is it's it's irresponsible and it's to some degree shameful that it's taken um something like this to make myself and I'm sure a lot of other labels and companies do that. Um, and I hope that, you know, I'm sure there's people in this chat and I'm sure there's others that will be in the chat later on. I mean, the discussion, not the chat room, um, that will be looking at the same kind of action. But I guess it's, it's frustrating. It's not for me to be frustrated about, but I think it's, you can't rely on major labels or a TikTok or an Instagram or whatever to make these changes happen. You have to make them yourselves. And I think this stuff, it's always going to be the smaller entities that do that before. And it has, it kind of is inevitably just going to go up the chain that way. Or I hope this sees other people kind of taking like transparent yeah. financial action. Cause something else that I think has been really um, frustrating this week is I've probably seen 500 plus artists and individuals donate good money and they're the ones that have had their live revenue taken away but i've actually not seen that many labels or whatever production houses or whatever you know bigger companies actually do that i think it's i don't think it should just be on the artist and individual so um i just want to because i've just been looking at the um live stream chat and there's some really good points about how a lot of black artists are sort of labeled as urban or you know that kind of and and that is actually one of the big things that i've been trying to work on the last couple of years trying to find because my artists um are predominantly quite left field of their genre 
I have a footwork artist um, who, you know, it's kind of a bit weirder. So that's the sort of music that I put out on my label, if, you know, for those who don't know. So um, when I've been looking for more experimental, weirder music, it is predominantly men and it is predominantly white, actually. And it's a, it, it, it isn't. That's the thing. There are fans there that are black. There are plenty of artists that are black, but it is harder to find them. And because of this bullshit of the whole, oh, you know, the urban. Um, and so I think when you upload things to SoundCloud, be happy to be like, don't you don't have to put yourself as urban. You don't have to tag yourself as that. But I think so many people just think, oh, you know, that's what it's put. I'm going to be put down as. And it, Can and I it's, say something? Yeah. I just something you just said there that uh, you was like the uh, the fans are black. You said that. You said the fans are black. Yeah, some some of them. Yeah. Where? Because this is my thing. If I like, hear what I'm saying. If I come yeah. to your party, Tom, or I come to your party, or I come to your party, Boilerman party, fans ain't black. I'm yeah. telling you that now. Fans are not black. So that's a whole nother thing. I mean, I know we're discussing about getting, you know, making things more inclusive, but you just said fans are black. And I don't, I've been talking about how unblack fans are, like in the last week. Like, fans is not black. Yeah, I do think that's a big, I, you know, and you know what I was talking about earlier about outreach into like communities, into the right communities. And when I'm talking about communities, I'm also talking about like online communities, stuff like that. So, I do think that is a big part of it, outreach. But I've noticed uh, Planet Mew parties used to be really white, really male when I first started going to them when I was, I don't know, 15 or whatever. More recently, when I go out, I definitely see all sorts of people and more kind of, you know, openly gay, openly different genders, all sorts of things like way more women and um so i think maybe because there's a change in the culture that they feel like they are safer to go to those places i'm not sure no this isn't um this isn't a leading question but like it's it must come from the roster to some degree as well right because i imagine muse roster yeah. has diversified massively in the last whatever 11 12 years yeah, from when yeah. i started following the yeah. label with the, you know so I think it I think it does come from them there as well. Yeah, definitely. I mean, you know, I know people hate saying this, like the whole if you see yourself up there, you feel safe to be there. And it's true, isn't it? I mean, that's part of the reason why I started Objects was because if I wanted people to see that there were women up there always doing this. Um, that's why some of my artists, you know, have been from a few years back um, and some artists that are coming up new um, and yeah I don't know it's, it's it is changing it is getting there but it's kind of weird that we're talking about this now because of this whole thing that's happened in America because to me it just feels like well I've always been feeling like this is something that's been changing I don't know I don't know but yeah yeah, I think there was some good, I can't remember who it was that started the, the thread now, but there was a thread on Twitter a while ago about the, um, I think it might have been Fawzia that started actually about the the kind of dividing line between like quote unquote house and techno and quote unquote bass. Um, mm -hmm. I think particularly in the festival scene, um, you know, which is such so clearly like a, you know, like a racially done thing. Um, mm. And I think that's, you know, this isn't an excuse. I think, you know, we can do as much as possible as, as you know, label owners or whatever to get our own ship in order and we have a responsibility to do that. Um, but I think the sort of bigger festival circuit and the bigger live circuit has, like, massive questions to answer when it comes to that kind of thing. Yeah, yeah actually, maybe that Blaise is... can speak to that. Maybe Blaze can speak to that because... Yeah, let me also ask, answer your first question because I don't want that to go unanswered around why did it take this? Um, 
you know, like firstly, there's no real excuse. There's just, um, I think, I think what's happened in the last couple of weeks is an amazing shift that's happening in the way people are responding to what's happening in America. In the, I think, the whole, you know, receiving calls from people who are like <laughs> telling me stuff that maybe was mentioned years ago, but is now being talked about in a very clear way, and the kind of frustration that this is lit off, I think, is actually pushed conversations that have previously been buried, even though they shouldn't be buried, um, up to the forefront. So, like I say, I feel like I've been very aware of where I sit with this stuff for a long time. Um, I'm not naive to it all, and but I think there's been a massive shift in the last couple of weeks, and I think it's as a result of a uh, response to this being far more confrontational about communication, about educating, and having really unpleasant conversations. The amount of conversations I've had a couple of weeks where, you know, it, it, you're going into spaces you don't like at all, and you realize when you come out of it, everything you thought was one way is the other way. So I don't think there's any excuse, but I'd say specifically, I think the, 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 the style of response on social media to what's happening in America, maybe it's just bubbling over, maybe it's a straw that camels back, but it's really effective in flushing out uh, what can be done to actually change things right at the root cause of it all. Someone mentioned at the least in the, in the chat, I do hear catch, but um, just to make it clear, like, please say black people like nothing else yeah. black people like, yeah yeah that's 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 it sorry that's it so i want to say Carry on. i mean look like, it's it's obviously a difficult one i don't i don't agree that when you go to a boiler event it's a white audience um i think all the people who've been most celebrated and clocked up views in the last uh five years at least has been uh like a really diverse a kind of range of artists and the crowds have more represented that. I think it could get a lot better, but I don't think it's um, across the board. Right? I mean, the, the festivals, I'm not sure I can speak to that that, that much. I think the general, um, I think I'd say the same thing again. I'd say most of these festivals are being run by white people. And I'm, I'm like my point at the beginning of this is going to be my point fairly repeat is that if you want things to change, if you want opportunities to open up, every organization from majors to independent festivals to Boiler Room to anyone, needs to rethink who's sitting at the top of their company and make sure that's reflected across it. If you don't do that, there will always be ignorance, biases, things, you know, should seem obvious to us, but are not obvious to us. You know, like, like, I grew up in like a really white, closed off environment till I was 18 and, uh, and then like got a wider group of friends and started to learn new things and new perspectives. And ultimately it's not on anyone to tell us this stuff but i guess you know the reason i, I look at boiling for example if you could look at a major label if you want to change the way every part of their output looks you need to have people at the top of that company and across all the key decision making areas uh making decisions so what about because those are the people who truly mm. understand the problem and who can actually make sure that they're you know, when you talk about bass music on Fridays and Saturdays being house and techno, though, those kinds of judgment calls entirely come out of festivals run by white people. Um, yeah, but that's why I think it's on. I was thinking about it earlier, and that's why I think it's on. You know, I just want. I would like to see it. You know, I'd like to see. You know, you and everybody being more inclusive, and then trying to do what they're doing in these venues because that's a whole nother thing that's a whole nother thing that even speaks to black people even wanting to come out you know we're talking about there's no black like, black people in the parties electronic music you know grime like it's all our thing as well there should be black people there but there is they're going to the o2 um i mean we which like, is another thing. i think that i think yeah 100 yeah, percent. i mean i'd say like a basic thing you can do is like one of, one of the ways in which we have, we did a festival last year and the way we approached it is we, uh, every single day was programmed by different people who took over different rooms and they had carte blanche to decide the lineup, uh, get involved in marketing, uh, host the event. And the crowd was amazing and it was completely reflective of the music being played. And I think, 
you know, if you can design a festival or an event of any sort where you play a role of a facilitator and where you don't, you try and move away from a kind of um, main stage versus satellite mentality, I think you can bring a wider range of voices in. But um, again, I think like, black, I, I, black, I believe black. we do. Sorry. Um, yeah, I, I, I guess I guess I, I basically I do 100% think that's important, and I think that the answer is to empower black people and black collectives and black artists. Um, like when we did that, with but that also means stepping back. That's it, that's it, the it, difficult thing, isn't it? Because you know, when you were at um, Notting Hill Festival, in a way, should you have got that money that you got because you're a white company Carnival. and so so a lot of people felt quite upset about that and uh, myself included i um posted about it on twitter at the time said it wasn't right and i don't think it is right that you know it's a black festival it's to celebrate black people in the uk and we don't get enough of that in the uk anyway so I think it's really important that at those in those spaces we shouldn't be there we shouldn't be there unless it's like you're gonna really make sure that it goes to the community and it's just it's not transparent enough i 100 percent agree with you i mean I, like we we went at that with <laughs> um good intentions and you know it was it was myself and a group of people at boiler room and spoke with the community, worked with the community, tried to figure out where we could help with what was going on. And um, and with hindsight, the whole way that we operate, you know, we tried, we were trying to kind of create something that, where they could they could kind of have a broadcast moment and they could uh, bring some brands and some cult, 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 arts council funding in. Like, in the end, I completely agree with you. I think these things should not be, like if you get into and speak to that community, they have no funding whatsoever. The government gives them nothing. And as a result, people like us or anyone ends up kind of trying to do a little bit within Carnival. But in the first place, that moment should be a national treasure. It should be funded by Arts Council. It should be funded by organisations. It should not be up to any sponsor. Or and I, I fully agree. Boiler Room had no role within that. Uh, we went in it with good intentions. We realised this was like a completely impossible thing to get involved in. It was the wrong you know it was the wrong association um but the fact that in the first place they're funding they have no media brand they have no way of even paying the bills of the committee that organizes each of carnival is like i say all these things come back to a really big systemic issue and much as i get like boiler room plus carnival plus IELTS council does not look good on paper there was a lot more to it than that but what i can tell you from spending a lot of time with that community and with people is they face it faces enormous problems that stem from the people in power. I've been to Arts Council meetings, and Arts Council do lots of good stuff, but I've been to Arts Council meetings to talk about diversity, and there's not a single brown person in the room. It is literally no black people, no mixed race people. It is all white. And so I guess I'd come back to the same point again, is all these institutions, all these big events, all these festivals, if you can't empower black people to own them or to run them or to have their voices heard or you can't take the biggest street dance this uh, in Europe and make it into a treasure just like a Glastonbury the output is always going to be all up there's going to be a, there's going to be real problems that you're pointing out and um, so I'm very for it and I but I think it has to all start with a systemic shift that kind of echoes some version of what I'm talking about what I want to change with us um, and I don't think you know, I think there's ways you can run your business and make those changes. Um, I don't think it means necessarily if you're if you're a, a white founder and you own the business, I don't think it means you have to just step down and disappear. I think it's just about um, making sure it's 2020 voices and representation should be balanced throughout the company. Okay. I was going to say, there's, there's a few questions because there's a lot of questions, to be honest. But uh, all right. So have you but from billy said have you ever wanted to get more poc involved and had trouble finding whether it's candidates for jobs artists to sign professionals to work with if so 
Like, what will you do to overcome that obstacle and why do you think that is? We've not had trouble. We've had amazing people. Honestly, I'd say flat. I said it in my post today. I'd say flat out. We, I've seen amazing people come and go at Boiler Room. Sometimes they're on a course. Sometimes it wasn't working out. And with hindsight, I blame, honestly, the culture within the company, the lack of representation at the top for why people would come in. You know, there were, there's been points that, uh, within our company where people have walked in and been like, this is amazing. I'm with incredible people from all areas of life. And, but, you know, 18 months in, they leave. And I think, I think so, so the answer is no from me. Um, uh, we've, we've never struggled finding really amazing people. Tom? Black people. Yeah, I'll, I'll be honest. I think we have struggled in some, like I say, not in terms of artists, but if you were to ask me, off the top of my head to name you 15 white engineers i've got the emails mm. to i'd be able to say yeah like that if you asked me to name 15 black ones it would take me a while and look i think there's that there's there's several issues there i mean one is well it just boils down to systemic racism and lack mm. of diversity in that field um but also you know like i said earlier i think it's you can't sit and rely on this stuff to come from the top down and this stuff to happen in other fields. You have to lead by example. So, you know, it is on us to like, you know, even if I don't have a black engineer that I can clip my fingers and ring, like I know God knows how many like black producers who mix down tracks incredibly. So, you know, it's on me to maybe make, I don't know, make some connections there and like introduce them to say the engineers we do use and say, look, why don't you give this guy a chance? Why don't you work with them? Why don't you, take them into your studio for it showing the ropes. Do you know what I mean? Like, I think I've, so being honest, I have found problems, but that's not to say there aren't attainable. Yeah, no, fixes. people are out there. Pe pe people are out there. Yeah. People are out there. Okay, mm -hmm. Another question. Uh, this is a bit more direct. Uh, this is from Danny Native, all the natives. Why, uh, why was I, a non-white artist, snubbed by a boiler room? And why did the panel that were aware of it and who I am not give a fuck or speak up? I mean, I don't, I don't know. I need a bit more. Con I don't know what. Um, I don't know what panel. I don't know what this okay. is what it's about. Okay. 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 Um, all I, don't, right. I don't mind answering the question, but I just need a bit more information. All right. Let me get to another one. Okay. So, uh, Shireen. What action is being taken to make sure that changes aren't reactive but intersectional and integrally understood to give rise to black communities without seeming reactive? I mean, I've got a lot to say on this, but like I, I, I'm going to keep it short because I'm going to keep repeating myself now, but I'd say for, for Boiler and specifically and for a lot of organizations, again, you need people at the top of the company where this will be front of mind and won't drift when it's not urgent. But I also think for all people, if you like one of the things we're going to work on is actually setting policy on your kind of understanding of this and then finding structures such as a chance for black people to talk and to talk about frustrations within the workplace on a regular basis with senior teams as a group uh, in some kind of forum. But I think you have to, if you're a white person, if you're a non-black person, you have to find ways of uh, forcing the conversation forward when it's not all over social media and when this isn't a big, you know, when it's not in these acute moments. Um, but yeah, like I'd say twofold, one is have uh, black leadership within your leadership, uh, it will never not be front of mind from that point of view. And two is create a routine around conversations and structures that force you to not, you know, as a white person or as a non-black person that force you to wait where you, where you can't kind of take your foot off the brake and where it doesn't just kind of fizzle out because you can't see the problem. Yeah, I don't disagree with Blazer, but I do think transparency about financial commitments from white run companies operating in the sphere of black culture is is important i think yeah. yeah i just think going forward it's all very well i think i'm sure we all did it in this, this panel to give money when there's like a you know a national tragedy that that is impossible to ignore and prompts this stuff but it's it's so much more important to i think financially as well as in talk of diversity have it you know become integral to your just how you run your company going forward 
I think we all have like an obligation to give back on on a simple financial level. Yeah, um, I just wanted to have a question for Blaze because um, I, I remembered a few years ago there was a documentary that was um, made uh, by Boiler Room um, talking to um, artists in Glasgow and there was an artist on there um, who's black who you cut out her saying um, in the final in the you know when it went uh, public um, and she was calling out her um, local white guys that were basically being racist or you know sexist all these different things and and that was actually cut from the final video that that went public so i'm just kind of it's kind of weird like i know look i know we've made mistakes in the past but to just say that they didn't happen is kind of i didn't i didn't say they didn't happen when i didn't say they didn't happen so so i can explain that the um i mean fundamentally it was a really bad mistake which is another example of uh so 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 from what I understand of the project, um, we, of our own decision, used her quote in the opening scene of the film because it was a great quote. It was something about Glasgow not being a white city, musically, but often seeming whitewashed. When that film went around to all the different people involved in the film, the local community were against what she was saying and we made the bad call uh, to... Um, to take it out. Now, I, w I, I can't speak personally, I wasn't involved in the edit, but we made a bad decision based on a kind of conflict on the ground trying to hit a deadline and it never should have happened. So firstly, I'm not in any kind of denial. I think we communicated all of this and this has all been talked about tons on social media as has Carnival. Um, but like, it was definitely a mistake. Uh, for the record, there were black people working on that film and on the edit and involved in these decisions too. But fundamentally, the head of that department made the wrong pull in a rush uh, and it was a really bad fuck up. But this is this is kind of my point is like, these things would not happen had we had proper diverse leadership within the company. Decisions like that would not slip through the net and not have been made um, mm. and have the impact that they have. All right. Okay. Cool. We don't have a um, loads of amount of time. Thanks for speaking. Uh, just you know, what would be good? I know a lot of been, a lot has been said. Um, you know, you you're going to change the room. You're going to make change to local action. You're going to make change to objects and what you know all the things you're around. It would be good to let this be transparent. I don't want it to be about you know just getting publicly saying stuff and saying stuff and then we don't actually. Think you know, I want, I want to like see it. I want to, I want to actually see it. You know, I want to, mm. I want to see it. I want to know that it's happening. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, 100%. Uh, this is not like, me I, going, not, this is I'm me not, talking to on, everyone. I agree with you. I agree with you. Like, honestly, I'm not big on social media. I plan to publicize all of the moves we're making and follow up on them, put things out there so people yeah, can exactly. hold me accountable. I'm in no way shy about the things we're looking to do and the mistakes we've made. And honestly, the transparency financially, I think is a great idea. A lot of our public records are out there, but I think there's absolutely, there should be, there are no skeletons in our closet. We should be cool with showing it. And I have no doubt the scrutiny would keep shoving us forward and forcing us to have uncomfortable conversations. So you get a kind of full yes from me on that point. And I will be putting stuff out very publicly about what we're doing and following up. I think the other thing with financial okay. transparency is it's just on a, on a byproduct, it can also force other people to step their game up a bit as well. And, you know, collectively, that just leads to more money being pushed in the right direction. So I think it's important for that reason, too. All right. I appreciate you guys for coming through. I'm going to have to switch you out now. Yeah, we appreciate have, uh, it. Thank you. Yeah, we'll be, we'll be watching. We'll be, we'll be watching.